I was a uh, professor of Old Testament exegesis and Semitic languages for 10 years and, uh, abs at Dallas Seminary and absolutely convinced uh, that God did not give the gifts of healing, gifts of prophecy, that he wasn't really doing those supernatural things anymore, and that he did not speak except in the pages of the Bible. And uh, I just hated that whole realm of impressions and subjectivity. I, I thought the feelings were the way to get us in trouble, and you could just count on your mind and rational understanding of this book. And then uh, 10 years into teaching, in my 10th year, on, in January 1986, I had a conversation with one of my heroes that changed the direction of my life. It was John, Dr. John White, the British psychiatrist, best-selling author back in those days, the, the number one author for InterVarsity Press. We used all of his books in our church. I was a, a professor uh, at Dallas and a pastor of Christ Chapel Church in Fort Worth. So that's how I divided my uh, week. And uh, he was one of the heroes at, at, uh, uh, at our church. I mean, uh, it wrote Parents in Pain, a phenomenal book on parenting. Eros Defile talked about the sexual things. And he was just so, he was, he was honest ahead of his time. And uh, we, we uh, had a conversation. We had a, we'd invited him to come to our church. And he called me and uh, said he thought he could do it. And in that conversation, he revealed to me that he not only believed in healing, that I had never talked to an intelligent biblical person who believed in healing. I, I, had, we, I lived in this isolated world of the biblical elite, and we, we just assumed everybody else, uh, like the Pentecostals, were emotional, didn't know scripture, so why would you want to even talk to them? Uh, it's just, you know, we were the guardians of God's pure doctrine, and, uh, it, and we actually said we're the best seminary in the world. Uh, we didn't know all the seminaries in the world, but we knew we were the best. Uh, so that's the mentality I was in. And now one of my heroes uh, says that he believes in healing. And that wasn't the worst of it. Uh, he said he had actually seen healing. He said people that he had prayed for had actually gotten healed. And that so rocked my world because I knew he was brilliant. He knew the Bible. And I knew just talking to him on the phone, he was much closer to God than I was. And I'd never talked to a person like that that believed in healing. And it so unsettled me that I spent the next four months uh, <clears throat> looking up every single healing story in the New Testament and asking it one question, God, why did you do it? And I, I told you that story on Monday night. And at the end of uh, four months, I was absolutely convinced that God was healing today, that healing was based in the eternal character of God, not in historical circumstance. So John White comes to my church uh, prays for people, and nobody get healed, but, but, but he leaves a massive uh, sort of uh, uh, con conflagration a little bit. I mean, it's kind of like, well, well, what were we doing all this stuff for? And, and as he's leaving, he tells me, the greatest healer I know, uh, the guy who hears God better than anybody I know, uh, his name is John Wimber, and today nobody knows that name. But 30 years ago, everybody knew that name. He was the most loved and hated pastor in America, among, especially among conservative evangelicals. Conservative evangelicals hated him because he was opening up conservative evangelicals, like me, to the gifts of the Spirit and, and to uh, listening to God. And, uh, and some of us loved him because we thought he was leading us back to the kind of church they had in the book of Acts. Uh, and, and everybody had an opinion about him. And and so, uh, but I hadn't met him. I'd never even heard of him. I, uh, he, he just wasn't in our tradition. And so John White told me about him. And the next week, he's coming to Fort Worth, Texas. And he's going to be speaking at Lake Country Baptist Church on the west side of Fort Worth. Jim Hilton was the pastor. And so I get 10 people in my church and I say, we're going to go hear him on Thursday night. And I don't know what to expect, but I, I got 10 people just in case he gets wild. You know, they can say, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Prof Deer wasn't doing that kind of stuff. And uh, so it's, it's Thursday afternoon. I, I come out of my office at Dallas Seminary, and I'm walking uh, around the uh, corner of Academic One, and I, and I see and hear a group of about 10 students all gathered together, and I hear the name Wimber mentioned. So I just stop and hang off by the, the building, and, and one of the fourth-year students said, yeah, God's honest truth. One of our graduates was in a Wimber meeting in Australia, and he said, Wimber walked into the room, said, come, Holy Spirit, and he said they all fell on the floor, started barking like dogs and vomiting. And I went, oh, no. What have I gotten myself into? 
I didn't know if I wanted to bark like a dog and vomit and <laughs> fall on the floor. I mean, I used to do that before I became a Christian. I just, <laughs> wasn't that much fun then. So now it's gone from being excited about meeting this guy, Wimber, to being warned about meeting this guy, Wimber. So we, we arrived late and sat on the very back row. I got 10 people with me, and we're all wearing suits and ties and that sort of thing. Uh, 1986, and, but nobody else is. And then Wimber comes out on the stage uh, wearing jogging shoes, uh, one of those squared off shirts that older men wear to hide their excess weight, but it doesn't really hide it. And uh, <laughs> looking just so casual, and, and he plays the keyboards and the worship team. I, I didn't know this then, but he had been the manager and the leader of the Righteous Brothers, that group that had a whole bunch of top 10. Uh, uh, singles in my, in, in my time, they've been in his band, and he could play 27 different instruments at one time. He's an amazing musician. And so then he gets up to speak, and I'm liking this guy. He reminds me of a good young life leader. He's kind of honest about his flaws. He's funny, down to earth. He's not saying anything uh, spooky. And then he says, uh, okay, it's, uh, it's clinic time now. And now I, I go, oh, this is where it gets spooky. And uh, he says, come, Holy Spirit. Now, that prayer's not in the Bible. Uh, it it kind of bothered me a little bit when he prayed a prayer that wasn't in the Bible. I prayed lots of prayers that weren't in the Bible, but it didn't bother me when I did it. It just bothered me <laughs> listening to him. And so uh, he says, I think uh, God will heal backs tonight. And so if you have a back issue, just come down. And man, across the front, there was this whole healing team. And some of the people on that healing team were like 18 years old. I didn't know this then, uh, but some of the people that will progress the fastest in the gifts are teenagers. You know why? Because they're reckless and they'll try anything and they're not afraid of failure. You get to be about 30 or 40 and you got too much to protect to be reckless. Um, and, and Wimber learned that early on. He would take these 18-year-olds over to London and they would pray for blind eyes and they would open up. Well, this is my first time to be in a meeting, so I haven't seen any of this kind of stuff. And so we're praying for back, okay, and you know. And then he, he's up there and he says, uh, there's somebody, there's a lady here, you haven't come forward, but you've got a back issue. Would you please come forward? And, and you know, you're, you're in pain. And, and she didn't come forward. And then he said, um, you went to the doctor on Tuesday and he said, uh, you're, you're just going to have to live with this pain. He said, would you please come forward? And now I'm going, wow, how did he know that? You went to the doctor on Tuesday? Nobody came forward. And he said, uh, this pain starts here, and it wraps around your back, and it comes out here. Would you please come forward? And nobody came forward, and I started feeling sorry for John Wimber. He was just doing so good when he was just talking about healing, you know. Uh, but he wasn't nervous at all. I was nervous for him. And then he said, your name is Margaret. Margaret, would you get up and come down here, please? Halfway down the center aisle, Margaret gets up and she starts trudging down like, why didn't I come the first time? And I went, ah, this is amazing. This is like the, the, what, I, I, the, what, what Elijah did. And, I, I, and, and the, they, they saw the, the, the plans of the Syrian commander in their bedroom. and they, This is like, this is incredible. And then all of a sudden, as she was walking down to the front, this wave of nausea just came over me. And I thought, what if he paid her to do that? I mean, this is just too good to be true. What if they take this show on the road on Saturday night, you know, and she's Mabel McClutch butt, and she comes down to the front with an envelope and two malignant tumors she's coughed. I don't, I'm just not going to, I don't believe it. And uh, about the time that nausea, that, that wave of uh, skepticism came over me, uh, Mike Pinkston, whom we led to the Lord in our Young Life Club 15 years earlier, and now is a member of my church, Mike screams out, that's Margaret, my sister-in-law. And Margaret Pinkston went down to the front and got completely healed with one prayer that night. And I talked to her afterwards, and, and she was called out by name. I didn't know that was possible. So I was, we, Lisa and I were second in line to talk to Wimber. Uh, and and uh, I, you know, I introduced myself. He goes, oh, John White told me about you. You're that professor from Dallas. And I, I said, yeah, that was amazing tonight. And, and he said, well, come on, let's walk around here. And so he started taking us around. And he would describe what was going on with uh, people as they were being prayed for. And he said, now you see that lady right over there? And I go, yeah, her name's Patricia. She goes to my church. He goes, well, she's getting ready to get healed. And I said, how do you know? He said, well, you can see the Holy Spirit on her. And I'm going, well, you can? <laughs> well, I mean, 
John could see the Holy Spirit on Jesus, but you know, I, didn't, I never met anybody that could see the Holy Spirit. And so that introduced, that, that he introduced me to this possibility of hearing God. And uh, within just a few weeks, we had become friends, and I was going to his conferences, and later I would come on his church staff, and he became my mentor in healing and hearing God's voice. And we were at one conference just about a year later, 3,200 people at his church in Anaheim, California. And uh, there were probably 100 people on the prayer team down here praying for people in the front. The ministry time had started, and I was standing down there praying for people. And John started walking off the stage, and he said, uh, uh, then he stops, and he turns back, comes back to the stage, and he said, uh, there's a lady here, uh, and you have cancer. Uh, would, you, would you please come down to the front and let us pray for you? You haven't come down yet. And then no lady came, and he just stood there for a little bit. He said, uh, you flew in on Tuesday. You came here to be prayed for, for your cancer. Would you please come down to the front? N nobody came down. He just waited another 30 seconds or so. And he says, uh, you're wearing a pink dress, and you're sitting in the very back. Would you please come forward? And a lady on the very back row, pink dress, who had cancer, got up and walked down to the front. You say, why didn't she come the first time? And it's like the devil came and sat on her lap and said, nah, this can't be you. Uh, you're still smoking. And she was still smoking. And so she just felt that guilt like this couldn't be her. And so she wasn't going to come down to the front. Well, afterwards, I, I go, John, that was amazing. I said, that must have been so clear. It must have been like a foghorn going off in your brain. He goes, no, it was just the opposite, Jack. It was so faint. If I hadn't been paying attention I would have missed it. I was just walking off the stage. I thought all the ministry time had been started. There was nothing else to do. And I just had the faintest impression that there was a woman with cancer out there. Tuesday? Well, he said when I called it out and she didn't come out, Tuesday just floated through my mind. It was just there for a second or two and gone. And I thought maybe that means she does what a lot of people do. Conferences start on Thursday. A lot of people come to Southern California two days early to see the, the beauty and experience it. And, and so that, I just call that out and I go, pink dress, back row, <laughs> and he said, well, when she didn't come down, I'm looking at the, at the building, and just for a couple seconds, I saw pink floating across the back row, and, and then it uh, disappeared. <laughs> I said, you just called out a woman in front of 3,200 people based on those flimsy impressions? He goes, yeah, yeah. I go, why? He goes, well, that's just the way the Lord speaks to me, Jack, and I've had better luck adjusting to his way of speaking than trying to get him to adjust to my way of hearing. <laughs> now see, until that conversation, I would never have known to pay attention to faint impressions or something as brief as a color floating across the room. I would never have known that God would speak like that. I never knew a prophet. And I saw, how, I saw prophets getting revelation, but the Bible doesn't tell you how it got them, right? Or how those words came. And, uh, and, and I had... I did a really thorough study of the voice of God in Scripture, and I want to share that with you tonight. Everybody in this room who knows the Lord Jesus Christ is capable of hearing Him in Scripture and outside of Scripture. He wants to be our friend, someone that we enjoy and someone where, that we can feel His pleasure in us, and He does that by talking to us, by giving us special revelation. Or I used to call it special revelation. I don't I think that's the right term anymore. He's just a friend who talks to us. Um, okay, so in your outline, the most common way that God speaks to us is through his written word. We all know that. All right, that's, that's the most common way I hear God's voice is in, in the scripture. But he will also speak, he'll also speak to us by appearing in person. So the risen Lord appears to his best friend, John, in the first chapter of Revelation, and John falls at his feet like a dead man. Then he speaks to his number, one, uh, 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 his number one enemy, Saul, before he becomes Paul, and Paul falls in the dirt like a dead man. The majestic Christ, the risen Christ, his beauty is overwhelming, and, and trying to take it in with, uh, with just natural eyes is an overwhelming experience. So he appears to people. He sends angels to speak to us, and, and, uh, act, and angels are famous for uh, jailbreaks in Acts. So here's uh, Acts 5, 19, 20 is one of their jailbreaks. Hebrews 1.14 says that God sends out angels to serve those who are inheriting salvation. They're our servants. When did he stop sending them out? 
Um, and then I told you uh, last night, I told you uh, story, the story about Lisa having two angelic encounters uh, that were preparing her to lose our son. Uh, and, and, and by the way, i just say one thing about the uh, loss of our, our son, Scott. We, we lost him when he was one month shy of his 22nd uh, birthday on December 27th, 2000, committed suicide in, in our home with my 44 Magnum, the gun we used to scare bears away. We lived on top of a mountain in, in Whitefish, Montana. And uh, well-meaning friends said to us, uh, you will never get over that. I can't imagine anyone going through this kind of pain. And, and they weren't being cruel. I, I knew what they were doing. They were trying to say, I can't imagine the pain you were going through. But every time I heard somebody say, you'll never get over this, I flinched inwardly. I just didn't want to believe that one reckless act of my son would maim me emotionally forever. And assuming that God and I got together again, because in those early days, I, I just, why pray? I mean, I prayed more for him than I prayed for anybody else. I was just questioning everything. Uh, I wasn't going to church. Uh, I, I go to church because I have something to say. I had nothing to say anymore. And uh, in those early days, it was really, really hard. But even it, hard as it was, I did not want to believe that God wouldn't heal me. And, and it was years. We went through a significant amount of pain. I mean, those first birthdays, Christmas, Easter, uh, Thanksgiving, and, and there's that empty seat. It was hard, uh, it was really hard. Um, but somewhere down through the years, uh, I don't know how it happened, and I'm not exactly sure when it happened, but uh, on one of the anniversaries of his death, it, it just sneaked up on me, and I look at my watch, and I go, oh, it's, it's the 27th. Uh, I didn't even realize it. And, and, I, and, and, I, and Lisa was watching TV. She hadn't realized it, and I thought, it's night. I don't, I don't think I'll mention it to her. And then it hit me. There's no pain. There's no, the sting of Scott is gone. And nothing but the sweetness of Scott is there and this anticipation, this joy of being with him again and seeing him in heaven right now praying for us. Uh, he's in that great throng that prays uh, for the people on the, uh, on the earth, the people before the altar that are uh, praying. And Lisa will tell you the same thing. We can't tell you exactly when. We certainly can't tell you how. But our God uh, has healed the wounds that were inflicted on us. And I just say that to anybody who may have gone through a recent loss, or maybe it's an older loss, there is healing for everything in the world, every form of pain because of the majesty, the beauty, and the power, and the love of our God for us. Um, so I, I told you about, about, about angels. Oh, and here's the funny thing happened to me in my church. Uh, after I started believing the gifts and we started having regular prayer teams for the sick in our, in our church, people started telling me stories about having angelic encounters. And they go, I've known you for 15 years. Why didn't you tell me that? And they go, are you kidding? You would have said I was crazy. I go, oh, good point, good point. Okay, I get it. <laughs> but I was hearing those stories all the time. Uh, and uh, he, angels really do appear to people. It's not that uncommon. Um, he'll speak in an audible voice. And uh, he'll speak in an audible voice to a whole nation. That's Deuteronomy uh, 4. To an individual, Exodus 3, the burning bush. And then he does it again in the New Testament. So there's a big crowd there in John 12. And... Uh, Jesus says, Father, glorify your name. And then this audible voice booms out of heaven and says, I both glorified it and will glorify it. And you know what it says in John? Some said an angel spoke to him. And others said, nah, it's just thunder. It's just thunder. Do you realize if he spoke in an audible voice in this room that some of us in this room might only hear thunder? And what does that tell you about hearing the voice of God? The condition of our heart is the key to hearing his voice. He could speak in an audible voice, but some people might just hear thunder. And Jesus, at this, this point, he wasn't trying to disguise that voice because Jesus says right after this, this voice didn't come for my sake, it came for your sake. So God was intentionally trying to get through to the people in that crowd, and some just heard thunder. Um, he'll he'll uh, speak in an audible voice to an enemy. You know, you know what Acts 9 is, that's the Apostle Paul in the dirt. Uh, so yeah, that happened in the New Testament. You know what? It's happened throughout history. He never stopped speaking in an audible voice. And uh, I was astounded to realize uh, after I started believing in the voice of God and I started, uh, uh, started tracing it through in history, uh, you know, Peter Marshall was, uh, was the uh, great Scottish Presbyterian chaplain 
of the Senate. He was famous, and people would stand in the rain for two hours to get into his church in, in D.C. As a young man in Scotland, he was saved by the audible voice. So it's pitch black. He takes a shortcut home, and he hears, Peter, out loud. And he, and he, he, he it jolts him, and he takes another step, and this time he hears it louder, Peter! And he falls to his feet, or falls to his knees, and he puts his hand out. One more step, he would have gone over an abyss. He was saved by the audible voice of God. That's not a Pentecostal. That is a conservative evangelical chaplain of the Senate of America. His wife tells that story in, in, in her biography of him. And I've never heard anyone call Catherine Marshall a liar. Yeah. I was a professor at Dallas Seminary. That book had been in print for a long time. I never knew that story. I wasn't looking for those kind of stories. Or one of my heroes, Francis Schaeffer. Edith, when she wrote, uh, wrote the biography of Francis, says twice in his life he, that she knows about, he heard the audible voice of God. And I've never heard anyone call her a liar. These are, these are conservative evangelicals. And if you get a book today written by an Asbury professor named Craig Keener, uh, 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 he's a New Testament professor, he's actually a savant. He's, he's got 22 books. His commentary on Acts is that long. It's like four huge volumes. Um, and he's, wrote a, he's written a two-volume work on miracles. The bibliography is 165 pages of fine print. And what he shows, he goes back to the beginning of the church and then traces miracles and prophetic words, the voice of God, traces them through history all around the world and comes up to this conclusion. There are hundreds of millions of credible eyewitness reports all over the world, including the Western world today. Today. Just get that book. It's amazing. It, and and uh, anybody that's going to write a book saying God's not doing that stuff anymore, read Keener's book and then try to say that. I mean, he is a, he is a savant. He is an incredible researcher who's able to hold all this stuff in his mind. I don't know how he does it. I mean, I know him. I've been friends with him for a long time. But it's, it's incredible. Um, so he will, he will speak. Oh, oh uh, uh, around 2000. 2003, 2004, um, Chad Hennings and I become uh, super close friends. He's, he was one of the great cowboys back in the 90s with the three Super Bowl rings. He was the, the all-pro defensive end. A lot of great stories about him. A sold-out believer. Uh, he and I become friends, and we start a men's group in my, uh, in my home. And you've got 12 guys sitting around a table, and we hire a French chef to come and do breakfast, and we spend like two hours every Wednesday morning together to, uh, um, just pursuing friendship with God. And one day I'm talking about hearing God's voice. Now, these are mostly got, these are all business guys and mostly CEO types. And I say, uh, anybody around here heard the audible voice of God? Okay, out of 12 guys, how many do you think? Four of them told credible stories of hearing the audible voice of God. I would, I would, if you'd ask me, I'd go, well, nobody around this table. Four of them, credible stories of hearing the audible voice of God. Um, he'll speak in a voice that's uh, audible to your ears alone. That is, you really hear it with your ears, but no one else in the room could hear it. That could happen to you tonight. So he comes down to the young boy, Samuel, in 1 Samuel 3, and he says, Samuel, so loud, Samuel gets up, goes into Eli's room, and says, what do you want, master? And, and Eli goes, I didn't call you. So he says, Go back to bed. And he, this happens three times. And on the third time, Eli goes, oh, I know who that is. That's the Lord calling you. Next time he calls you, say, here I am at your service. And then come tell me the message he gives you. He heard it. Uh, he heard it in his ears, but nobody else could hear it. And this happened to the Apostle Paul. The Apostle Paul heard Jesus speak, but none of the guys with him could hear him speak on the uh, road. He'll speak in an internal audible voice. This is, where, uh, this is where it's just like an audible voice, but you're not hearing sound. The sentences are just forming in your mind. This is what the prophets, I, I think this is what the prophets mean when they're writing and they say, the word of the Lord came to me saying, and then these beautiful paragraphs just start streaming out. I don't think the Lord was dictating to them. I think he was using their vocabulary, but it was him using, it was him putting the thoughts in their minds and they're just writing it out. Um, I have that happen to me not infrequently, that he'll speak full sentences, uh, just as clear as an audible voice. When I was living in Anaheim and working at John Wimber's church sometime in the early 90s, I was, I was on my way to work, and I was driving down the 90 freeway, and I was singing. 
and I'm not a good singer, and, and so I usually wait till I'm in a car by myself. And so I'm singing at, at just the top of my voice, and I realize, man, you are really happy. You're, you're not your normal, morose, sullen, bitter self. I mean, how, I'm going I'm to keep this going. <laughs> and I started trying to figure out, why am I so happy? Um, I didn't have a new toy. Nobody said anything nice about me. I didn't have some exotic trip to look forward to. I just really happy. And I started thinking about my life, and I, I thought, you know, you are probably reading the Bible more than you've ever read the Bible just for the pleasure yourself, not for sermons or messages or anything else. And you're praying more than you've ever prayed before. And it's true. I would get up from my uh, uh, desk and I'd tell my secretary, I'm gonna, we, we, our church was in a huge warehouse, and I'd tell my secretary, I'm going to be gone for an hour. Don't try to find me. Just take calls down. And I would go in some dark corner of that warehouse, and I would just open up my spirit to the Lord and pray, and sometimes just weep, and it was like a wonderful experience, and I, I would do it for an hour, and I'd never done that before. And then uh, I was fasting for the first time in my life. I hate fasting. Uh, once in a while, one of my friends will say, I forgot to eat lunch. That sentence does not compute in my brain. <laughs> I just, how can you forget to eat lunch? I mean, I may not eat lunch, but I'm painfully aware of the fact I'm not eating lunch. Uh, and so for the first time in my life, I'm actually fasting on a regular basis and enjoying it. And so I go, that's why you're so happy. And I'm just kind of reaching back there, Pat, you're, it, you, you're more spiritual than you've ever been. I mean, and, and that was before I knew feeling spiritual was a bad thing. Not good. Uh, so I'm just patting myself on my back, and all of a sudden, the internal audible voice explodes in my, in my brain. It says, don't rejoice in your commitment to Jesus. Rejoice in Jesus. If you rejoice in your commitment to Jesus, it will lead you into self-righteousness. Man, it was like my whole life came into focus. And, and I saw myself climbing up this mountain and being really happy and and then getting higher and higher. And then all of a sudden, I noticed that I was higher. And then I started looking down on people and going, wait, I'm really up here. I'm higher than those people. And the next thing you knew, I was out in the wilderness for a long time. He just showed me that one of the major sin patterns of my life, rejoicing in my commitment, leading me into self-righteousness and feeling superior. And, uh, and I'd never, ever seen that before. Somebody says, well, you got the Bible. Why, why do you need to hear the voice of God? Well, you know, the Bible tells me self-righteousness is, self is a bad thing. It'll never tell me I'm self-righteous. Right? No, you have to have a person tell you that. If, 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 you, if, if you are self-righteous, by definition, you're not going to know it. Right? There, it's not because that sin is so small. It's because it's so characteristic of us. When, when, we're, when we're in it, without that without that merciful voice, I would have just been headed for another wilderness. And it's like the Lord Jesus came down and sat beside me in the car that, that day and said, Jack, you're headed for the wilderness again. I want to show you why. I want to stop this. I got a better plan for your life if you'll listen to me. He's great. <laughs> I mean, just there was a time I could never have heard that. And, and then I started pursuing that voice for the sake of the voice. Just hearing it is wonderful. Um, he'll speak through impressions. Uh, I like the way Lewis talks about it. C.S. Lewis talks about an impression. He says it's like a whisper. That sense so welcome. Ah, that's, that impression. Maybe that's God. Yet never welcomed without the overcoming of a certain reluctance or resistance. Oh, I, that, that just feels like a, oh, probably not. I mean, that's kind of, that, probably, got, eh, probably not. That, that's usually the way impressions from God come. We welcome it first and eh, maybe not. Uh, and especially if you have to act upon them. Um, let's see. Let's uh, see. I mean, skip down to number four. Here, here's one of the forms of the impression, number four. Sometimes the impression will come and the ability to see something in or on a person that you can't see with your physical eyes. So in Acts 14, Paul is in Lystra. He's uh, preaching a sermon there, and he looks at a lame guy right in the middle of the audience, and it said Paul perceives or saw that he had faith to be healed. So how do you see faith on somebody? It's an impression. It's like... It, it, it's from the Lord. And so he calls the guy to stand up. The guy stands up, and bam, he's healed. Um, 
I get those all the time. I get impressions all the time. I'll get them in meetings like this, just looking at people, or I'll get them before a meeting or, or during a meeting, or I'll get an impression when I'm, uh, when I'm driving along. Uh, he'll, uh, he speaks through the natural world. So in Romans 1, 19 to 20, Paul says that the, the creation reveals the, the power, uh, majesty of God. Or in Proverbs 6, the, uh, the wise man says to the sluggard, go look at the ants. And, and the ants are a revelation of the power of discipline and wisdom, and, and they're smarter than you are. Uh, sometimes he'll speak to us, he'll, he'll illuminate something in the natural world, and, uh, and it's a message from him. So it, it was somewhere in the early 90s, I was doing a conference uh, with a bunch of vineyard churches in the central coast of California, and it was ministry time, and I was standing on a stage with a, a few other people, and this kind of rare disease, I can't remember what it was, but I remember it was, it, was, it was rare. It wasn't something really normal. It just passed through my mind. I thought, oh, God will heal that. And, and so we're all still being quiet and waited on him. And I'm looking down like that. I'm thinking about this disease. And I open my eyes, and I look on one of the guitar monitors, and there's a dime and penny. And I'm just staring at that dime and penny, and I'm thinking, Why am I, what does that mean? Why am I staring at that? 11 cents. And I go, ah, that means 11 people have this disease. But I'm thinking, probably not, because it's not that common. And so I call it out, and I say, I think 11 people have this condition. And, uh, you know, 500 people in the room, 11 people had that condition, exactly 11, and they came up. And uh, it was illuminated for a minute. And, and you can tell sometimes when he illuminates something in the natural world, and there's a message that comes from it. Uh, he'll speak through fleeces. Um, and sometimes I'll use the fleece. I'll say, God, if you want me to do this, have such and such happen. But I don't like to use them very often because every time I say, God, if you want me to do this, have this other thing happen, I'm confessing I'm not really close enough to you to hear your voice like I usually do. Uh, I, I heal honor fleeces, and, and, and there's, I think it's still fine to use them. I just don't want to do it uh, a lot. Um, he speaks through dreams. If you're prophetic, you're going to be, you're going to be a dreamer. Uh, in Job 33, it says, why do you complain that God doesn't speak? He does. He speaks one way, now another way. He speaks through dreams, and, and especially dreams that are warnings to uh, change your uh, behavior. He'll speak through visions in uh, Acts 2, 17 to 18. This is a promise. Even your children are going to have dreams and visions. Even children, he says in Acts 2. Um, so back in the... Uh, Somewhere in the 90s, it might have been late 90s, I was here uh, in the Houston area, and I was speaking at uh, uh, St. John the Divine Episcopal Church in River Oaks. At the time, it was like the third largest Episcopal church in the country. And they asked me to come there and speak on, uh, on hearing God's voice and on healing. Okay, so it's uh, Saturday morning. The place is packed out. It's not an empty seat in the place. And, uh, and, and so I, I come to this sentence like this, and I'm saying, uh, and, and sometimes God will, God will speak through a vision. A, a vision is just a picture while you're awake. And when I say picture, I look over here on this side of the wall, and I see an esophagus dangling down. <laughs> and I'm talking, and I'm looking at the esophagus. I just keep right on talking. <laughs> and then I watch that esophagus go dangle like the, and I follow it all the way across, and never stop talking, follow it all the way across the room and when it hits that wall it disappears and I'm thinking well God wants to heal must want to heal esophageal problems and so I just stop and I say uh, I don't say I saw a picture or anything like that I just say uh, <laughs> I just say uh, you know what I think God will heal esoph esophageal problems so if you have reflux esophagitis hiatal hernias and I started naming off uh, problems with the esophagus um, would you please just stand up so we could pray for you? And I, I promise you, almost a quarter of the room got up. You know, those Episcopals, you just don't understand. Oh, just, kidding. Just, just kidding. Quarter of the room got up, but that, there was more people than a quarter of the room. You know how I know? I'm watching women hit their husband like that. You get up now. <laughs> I'm not getting up. Uh, and so we started praying right, right there on the spot just for uh, esophageal problems. And we got back reports for weeks of people healed of esophageal problems. And it just started with a little picture over there on the wall. And I didn't get the dangling like this and, and disappearing until months after it happened. What the picture was showing, there's people all over the room with esophageal problems. See, God's so creative. I mean, just creative. Um, so, uh, oh, trances. 
uh, a trance is where uh, it's more than a vision. It's where you're completely taken someplace. It's like you're out of your body, or at least it feels like you're out of your body because you can't see your hand or anything else. You can't see the room, and, and everything else goes except what God wants to show you. So it, uh, I was still a professor at Dallas Seminary. One of my students came in uh, late in the afternoon. I'm working, and uh, he, he, wants to, he, he wants to turn in a late assignment. And my policy as a professor was, I'll take late assignments. I'll take anything. Uh, you, you already have enough pressure on you. You got to work besides do this and so. But he's going on and on, on about this excuse. He wa- he wants to feel good about giving the latest assignment. I just wanted to put the paper down and get out because I can get back to work. And so I'm listening to him drone, and all of a sudden, he fades away, and I'm someplace else. I can't hear his voice. I can't see my wall anymore. I'm not in my chair. I don't know where I am. This is this is the second time it's happened to me. But I just kind of and then. Right in front of me, it, I don't my face. I say in front of me, but I mean it's just here. I'm, I'm just aware of, in big block capital letters, the word pornography. And then it fades, and then I come back into my office, and then I hear him talking again, and I think that means he's into pornography. And uh, so I have a debate in my in my heart whether I'm going to say anything to him or not. Um, but I decide I'm, I'll go ahead and risk it. I think. You know, I've been asking the Lord to speak to me. So, And this was actually one of the very first times the Lord spoke to me in, in a graphic way like that. And uh, I, I looked at him. I said, uh, forgive me if this is just off the wall or invasive. Uh, but I think while you've been talking, the Lord has been telling me that you're into uh, pornography. And, uh, and I saw in his eyes he was going to lie to me. And I said, wait, wait a minute, wait a minute. Before you say anything, uh, I, I think the Lord wants to set you free. And nobody is ever going to know your name. You're not going to get in trouble. So then he kind of relaxed. He put his head down. And he says, well, I was. And I said, when's the last magazine you bought? And he says, well, it was last week. Um, this, these were in the days you didn't have phones. and You didn't have porn on computers. He, you had to get magazines. And, uh, and then it, it had been going on since he was about 12 or 13, became a Christian at 17, but never shook the uh, porn habit. And, and so I said, well, God bless you. I, I think, you know, God is showing me this because he wants to set you free and he really loves you and, and we all fall into traps and, and, and so would it be okay if I pray for you? And he says, sure. So he's, he's uh, sitting on the other side of my desk and I walk around and I put my hand on his shoulder and Wimber told me, uh, before you pray for people, pray and ask God to speak to you about the person and, and, and what to pray. And, you know, sometimes you hear something, but sometimes times you don't. And, and so I put my hand on his shoulder and I started to pray and I, I just I went, uh-oh. And I back, backed off and I said, there's more here than pornography, isn't there? And he started weeping he, and he wept for the longest time. He just put his head on my desk and sobbed and sobbed and sobbed and said, I'm so ashamed. I'm so ashamed. Um, and then finally he was able to stop weeping uh, and he told me the depth of the trap that he had fallen into. And he was a good kid. But the problem was he was in an environment where if anyone knew any of this stuff, he would actually be kicked out. He actually had a calling on his life to be a pastor. But if anyone found this out, he wouldn't have gotten helped. He would have gotten kicked out. And uh, so then when he told me everything, I led him in a prayer of repentance and prayed for him and prayed for any evil that attached itself to leave and, uh, and hugged him. And, and I said, you know, I'm here for you. Be your friend. Help you. Uh, for anything you need, you just you, you, you tell me. We'll stay close from now on. And uh, so I hung around seminary to about 8.30 that night. And I was walking uh, across the quadrangle and then came uh, in front of the library. And uh, he was sitting in the very back of the library. It's about 8.30 at night. And he saw me and he jumped up, ran out the library door, threw his arms around me and says, I'm lighter. Something happened to me and just hugged me and cried. And uh, I, I, as long as the rest of the time I was in seminary, I stayed in contact with him and uh, totally free, walked totally free. Um, and every once in a while I'd be in some, yeah, it's great. <clears throat> I'd be in Australia or New Zealand or someplace like that and I'd see one of our graduates and they said, oh, I just heard from him and they would name the student's name. He says, he wants to know, he wants you to know he's doing fine, he loves you. Uh, and I got messages like that for seven, eight years and then kind of uh, lost contact with him. Uh, it was a trance. 
I would never have known that if God had not shown me. There's, and, and he would never have been helped had God not spoken like that, because he's never going to make that confession in that environment. Uh, how do you recognize the voice of God? So how does he speak? Here are the three questions. How does he speak? How do you know it's God? And how do you get him to speak to you? Okay, so real quickly, four voices always speak to us. God speaks to us. Uh, our own voice speaks to us. Sometimes my desires, uh, I will mistake my desires for God's voice. So I want to know the difference between my desires and God's voice. Uh, others speak to us. Sometimes the pressure I feel from others, I'll interpret as God speaking to me. Every year this happened, we'd have a seminary student, maybe as late as the fourth year, decide to drop out. And I say, why are you dropping out? And he, and he said, well, I thought it was God calling me to seminary, but it was really just the pressure I, I felt to please my parents. It wasn't God at all. And I've not been happy the whole time I've been here. So sometimes we miss the, the pressure we feel from others, we, we mistake for God's voice. And then the devil speaks to us. Uh, he speaks with, with spirits of divination. Uh, very common for him to speak with, uh, with the spirit of fear. Uh, 2 Timothy uh, uh, 1.7, God's not given us a, spe- a spirit of fear, but of love and sound judgment. Uh, and the other night we were praying for people who uh, were afraid, of, there were like 50 people in the room, maybe more, that had this fear that they were going to die before their time or someone they loved were going to die before their time. That's a real common tactic of the devil. Use this fear to, uh, to defile us. Um, and then uh, he, he's the accuser of the brethren. Uh, he, he accuses us virtually every time we pray. Have, how many of us have noticed that when we go to ask God for a big thing, we always start thinking about our sins? God, I want you to do this great thing for me. And then we start thinking of these reasons why he won't do it. You know, I should have been this, you should have been that. That's not natural. That's not the natural response of a child of God. That's the accuser of the brethren. He knows the most important thing we do is prayer. prayer the praying Christians are his downfall. God governs the world through the prayers of his saints. And so he, the devil, his number one plan, his number one strategy is to keep us from praying. And one of the ways he does that is through making us feel like we're not worthy to ask this. And what he's really trying to convince us is that God's goodness is contingent on our goodness. We're not going to experience his goodness unless we're good. And and we're never really all that good. Have you noticed that yet? (laughs) It it took me a while to figure that one out, that I'm never going to do much better than a subpar performance. The older I get, the less impressed I am with my performance. And so if I'm going to find my self-esteem in my performance, it's not going to be very good. If I'm going to find my confidence in God's ability to hear my prayers for my performance, I'm not going to pray that much. But if I'm confident in God's goodness, well, that's a whole new ballgame. His goodness doesn't rest on mine. Um, Four tests help us recognize the voice of God. God doesn't contradict his written word. Uh, God's voice has a consistent character. Uh, The fruit of the voice is good. Uh, and this was one that's really helpful for me. God's voice is different from our voice. My thoughts are not your thoughts. My ways are not your ways. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my thoughts and ways higher than yours, right? So when I have this, this impression that comes in, and it's just the opposite of what I normally think, I pay attention to that. Uh, so Paul del- uh, illustrates this for us. In Acts 16, 6 to 10, he's on a missionary trip with uh, Silas. What do you do on a missionary trip? It's not a trick question. <laughs> Pre- preach the gospel, right? Okay, so they start this missionary trip, and God says, you can't preach the gospel here. So they go, okay, fine, we'll go to another place. And God says, you can't preach the gospel here either. I mean, it's just the opposite of what they thought. They, they had a missionary trip to go preach the gospel. And there's only one place he's going to let them preach the gospel, but they don't know that when they start out. So uh, I'm in my car. I'm, uh, I'm driving... Uh, Back, uh, back from uh, Dallas to Fort Worth, and in our church, we're having a, ben, a big men's shooting weekend. We're, we're going out to a ranch. We're going to have, have uh, ski, sporting clay games, and I got a shotgun in my car that one of the guys has to use, but I have to get it fixed. So uh, I'm going to take it to the Bass Pro Shop, and then I have this impression, no, just, just this faint impression, take it to the mom and pop shop that's 20 minutes further away. But I'm already pressed for time, and so I decide to ignore the impression. But the impression won't go away. And I don't have 20 extra minutes, I think, but the impression just won't 
go away. And so finally I go, ah, this is just the opposite of what you think. This is an Isaiah 55 thing. So I look up and I say, Lord, I hope this one's from you. I'm going to go to the mom and pop shop. And so I go to the mom and pop shop. Um, and the young guy meets me behind the counter there. And I say, got to have this shotgun back by Friday. I'm a pastor. We got a men's shooting retreat. And one of the guys has got to use that. So can you get it back by Friday? And he says, you're a pastor? And I go, I go, yeah. And then he lowers his voice and says, can I talk to you? And, uh, and he puts his head like that, like outside. And so I walk outside. Uh, he's a meth addict. His first question is, do you know anything about drugs? And I say, I know a lot about drugs. Uh, and he says, I'm, I'm afraid I have to tell my dad tonight, and I think it's going to ruin everything. I think it's going to kill him. And so we start talking about it. And I said, I've got some help for you. And I've got some guys in, in the church, and we'll help you through this. And so for a time, we were really able to help him. I was uh, riding, going home that evening, and I was just thanking God and praising him. Uh, I'm just driving in the car, and, and he looks down, and he comes down and sits beside me in the car and, and says, Jack, I'm going to redeem a little bit more of your pain today. That's one of the promises he made when I lost my son. He says, you stay with me, and I'll redeem this pain. I'll use you to give help to the hopeless. Uh, and I just thought, you are amazing. You are so special. It made me feel so honored that he would trust me with this, uh, with this boy's pain and give me a message uh, to help him. He didn't tell me that ahead of time. I had to obey the impression that was the opposite of what I thought I should do. When I, when I get an impression that's just the opposite of what I think, I pay real close attention to it. So um, how, uh, who hears his voice? Really, his friends hear his voice. The deeper our friendship with him, the more we enjoy him and feel his pleasure in us, uh, the greater we're going to hear his voice. And the more we practice, you just can't get away from practicing hearing his voice. And that means you can't get away from failing. I mean, I, I stood before people and said, is there anybody here with this? And, and no. And, and I just got through giving a message on how to hear God's voice. Uh, and I'm wrong in front of people. Uh, nobody learns anything without failing at it, right? Uh, the only good golfer you see is a bad one who didn't give up. And it's the same thing with hearing his voice. And in our churches, when we're having our home groups and, and other things, we have to create an environment that's conducive to failure where we learn to laugh at the failures and support one another on and brag on one another for trying. Um, and then we're going to end up hearing his voice. Um, tell you one last story, and then we'll, then we'll pray to hear his voice. Um, in, uh, before I left Anaheim, we, we brought uh, a really great prophetic trainer on. His name is John Paul Jackson. And uh, in, one, in one Sunday night... Uh, neither one of us had responsibilities in the Sunday evening service. And uh, I said, hey, John Paul, come on with me. Let's go back and talk to the 12-year-olds, 10 to 12-year-olds. We had 200 of them in a, big in a big room in the back of the warehouse. And uh, he goes, okay. And, and so we get them for like two hours while the ser service, the ministry time is going on. And uh, I don't even pray about what I'm going to do. I mean, they're just 10 to 12-year-olds, right? And so uh, I got my Bible under my arm and I got this fairly decent working knowledge of the Bible, and I think, you know what? I'm going to let those kids ask me any question they want about the Bible and uh, or what it's like to be a pastor, and, and I'll answer it, and, and they're going to be wild. I mean, I wouldn't say that out loud, you know, to anybody back then, but I was already exulting in the wowing of the kids. And, it, and so John Paul and I uh, walk in there and say, okay, kids, you can ask anything. First kid raises his hand, and he says... And he's just troubled. He goes, why does God let bad things happen to good people who love him and try to follow him? And I'm thinking, why does God do that? Um, you know, problem of suffering, like 2,000 years, nobody's answered that. Um, but I'm not going to say I don't know the answer. What we do if we have a little theological sophistication is we just lapse into jargon when we don't know. And so I, I say, well, you see, in the beginning... God wanted friends and not robots, and so he had to give us the dignity of free choice. And I'm watching their little bored eyes and their faces start turning away, and I kind of trail off, and I go, okay, next question. And, and uh, this little kid uh, raises his hand, and he goes, 
why did God create the devil? Yeah, like you know why God created the devil? <laughs> why did he create the devil? I mean, I know a couple, one passage that might talk about his creation, but that never says why. And so, uh, so I say, well, you see, in the beginning, God wanted friends and not robots. And so <laughs> they were less impressed the second time. It's like some demon from hell smuggled all the unsolved theological problems in a list that night and said, here, kids, ask him this. And after about 40 minutes of abysmal failure, I said, no more questions. One kid in the back room waved his hand like that, said, no more questions. Just wouldn't stop waving his hand. I go, okay, what? He said, "Uh, I want to know what Noah and, and those folks on the ark did for that whole year when they were floating on the water. You do? That's easy, kid. They fished. Another little kid shoots up his hand and says, well, they didn't fish very long. I said, why is that? He goes, they only had two worms. <laughs> I, I, I look over at John Paul and I say, is the Lord showing you anything about these kids? He's not showing me anything. And, 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 and John Paul goes, yeah, I, th- I think so. So there's a little uh, skinny girl, freckles, red hair, just as cute as she can be. She's sitting on the front row. And, he, and John Paul says something about, about that young lady right there. That young man right there points to a 12-year-old. And that lady in the back, and he points to one of the Sunday school teachers. And I go, there you go. Be my guest. And he looks at the little girl in the front row. And he says, what's your name, honey? And she says, Julie. <laughs> now, Julie is not sure she wants some prophecy from this prophet with the spooky eyes and the gray beard in front of 200 of her friends. And so he says, Julie, while Jack was talking, I saw you on, it was Tuesday night, and I saw you in your bedroom, and you were crying. And honey, you were crying really hard. And you prayed, you looked up at heaven, and you prayed, and you said, God, do you love me? I have to know. He said, you didn't hear anything on Tuesday night. But God sent me here tonight to tell you he really loves you. And he wants you to know that trouble going on uh, in your home, it's not your fault, honey. And, uh, and then he said something equally wonderful over the boy and then over the lady. And I've been around long enough by then in prophetic ministry to know that not everything is as good as it looks. And so I, I want to make sure that everything that John Paul said was true and that if they had any questions, we could resolve them before they left the room. So I called all three to come up. And I looked at little Julie and and I said, Honey, uh, were you crying in your bedroom on Tuesday night? And she said, Yes. And I said, Did you say, God, do you love me? I have to know. She said, Yes. And I said, Honey, are your parents fighting? She says, Yes. I said, Are they talking about getting a divorce? She said, Yes. And I said, And do you think that's your fault? And she looked up and she smiled and she said, not anymore. I walked out of there that night and there were thousands of people on either side of me, but I was all alone. Uh, I was thinking about another 12-year-old boy who couldn't tell the difference between his sins and his parents' sins and how my father ended the war with my mom by killing himself. I know what it's like to grow up hopeless, feeling like a mistake, like you're the cause of, of something that's not your fault. I know what that's like. And I thought about that little 12-year-old girl. I thought, you know, 20 years from now, maybe, just maybe, she won't be sitting in a psychiatrist's office trying to work through 20 years of guilt that are not her own because the sovereign voice of the Lord Jesus Christ just came down in a room and took that guilt away from her. You see, when you grow up in a sick home, You keep secrets in that home. You don't let them out. And there's no way she was going to say what was going on. It had to be revealed by the Spirit of God. I had this great Bible, but it didn't tell me there was a 12-year-old girl sitting on that front row that was dying in guilt that wasn't her own. The Bible tells me what to do about that girl once I know, but it it won't point her out to me. Only the sovereign uh, voice of God could do that. And I think, who wouldn't want that ministry in their church? It's, been, it's all through the Bible. Who wants to live without being able to hear the voice of God? 
And the, and the great news for uh, the body here is, is that uh, this, is what, this is what God is giving to you now. This is the ministry that he is intent on giving to the church. Um, raising up prophetic voices, healing teams um, for all ages, for, uh, for all ages. And, it, and uh, it's going to be a wonderful, wonderful thing to be a part of and get to watch.